War has broken out. Where or how, nobody knows any longer. But the fact remains that by now, behind each person's head, its mouth agape and panting, a war of crimes and insults, of hate-filled eyes, of thoughts exploding from skulls. It's there, reared up over the world, casting its network of electric wires over the Earth's surface. Each second, as it rolls on, it uproots all things in its path, reduces them to dust. It strikes indiscriminately with its bristling array of hooks, claws, beaks. Nobody will survive unscathed. Nobody will be spared. This is what war is. The eye of truth. Most of my life is taken by writing. It's, uh, most of my life is uh, living as a sort of witness in the best of the cases, a witness. In the worst, being just a voyeur. I have seen something and I made the nutriment of what I've seen. J.M.G. Leclesio won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2008. His 60-year writing career has yielded a diverse and prolific body of work. Novels, autobiography, journalism, academic writing, translations of ancient texts. Acclaimed for literature that conveys the splendour of the world, but that also examines its brutality, Leclesio is seen as a writer who can describe our sense of being and gets to the heart of what it is to be human. He burst onto the literary scene in France in the early 60s, winning the prestigious literary award Le Prix Renaudot, aged just 23, with his first published novel, Le Procès Verbal, translated into English as The Interrogation. It was, in my, in my idea, it was a, more inspired by fashion was more uh, under the influence of others. So I wrote it in a cafe because it's a good place to be not too much yourself. You hear people talking. I, I, I write better when someone tells me a story and it's already a literature. So if someone uh, speaks in a cafe and uh, tells what he, have seen in, what he has seen in the, in the street, then it's a story, then it's literature, then I can write it. I like words before everything else. So if you tell me a good story, then I can write it. Uh, some people talked about strange stories. They, they were fighting against a rat in their flat. So I put that in the, in the novel. They had seen a, a drawn man on the promenade des Anglais. So I put that in the novel. I was listening to what, what they were seeing. The sea had already ravaged his body. A few hours more, and he would have looked like a fish, one felt. His hands were blue and swollen, and on his feet, one bare, the other shod, there were tufts of weed. From the depths of his clothes, which were twisted round him, soaked and saturated with brine, his head and neck hung out limply. His face, though dead, was curiously mobile, crawling with a kind of movement quite alien to life because of the water that puffed out his cheeks, eyes and nostrils and rippled beneath the skin. Within a few hours, this man of about 40, honest and hard-working, had become a liquid man. Everything had melted in the sea. His bones must be jelly now, his hair seaweed, his teeth tiny stones, his mouth, an anemone, and his eyes, which were wide open, were veiled by a kind of glaze. The, 
The most extraordinary moments of my life is when I write. Sometimes living again what I've lived, or sometimes living another life, or sometimes being someone else, which is uh, what I prefer, being someone else. I think that most of uh, the things you write when you are a writer come from your early childhood and your early uh, youth. You, you uh, gather all those things in the, in the, let's say, the 15 for first years of your life, and then you restitute them uh, along all the rest of your life. It's the, uh, those are the best years because everything is so burning, so, so intense, so quick, it, it happens all the time. It's the most dangerous period of your life as well. Leclesio grew up in wartime Nice after the German occupation with his mother, brother and grandmother. The family had to go into hiding as his father was a British medical officer then stationed in Africa. After the war, Age seven, Leclesio traveled to Nigeria to be with the father he had never met. Going to Africa was leaving, uh, um, leaving my grandmother, leaving every, everyone I knew, and going to a place I would not know. And um, to get to be reassured, uh, I had to write. It, it was a way of, of feeling uh, reassured in my life. So I wrote a novel called A Long Travel, A Long Voyage, which was my first novel when I was something like seven years old. I wrote that in a boat, uh, in, a, in a boat going to Africa. And the travel was quite long. And writing in a boat is very good. It's very nice. You have a lot of time. And especially at that time, the, uh, the boats were very slow. They were going from harbor to harbor. So um, it was a good, good opportunity to write. And then I, I didn't quit writing, I, I kept the habit. That night, their first night at sea, Fintan could not sleep, he did not move. He held his breath to hear Mao's regular breathing, despite the vibrations and creaking of the ship's frame. His back ached with fatigue the hours of waiting in Bordeaux on the quay in the cold wind, the rail journey from Marseille, and then all the days preceding their departure, the farewells, the tears, the voice of Grandmother Aurelia telling a thousand funny stories in order not to think of what was happening. The tearing, the void left in one's memory. We were on the Cross River, which is a small, uh, small river going uh, inside the country, and we were far from the coast, far from everything. There was no electricity, no uh, current water, no drinkable water. Uh, we were living in a house made of mud and leaves. And uh, for, for two years, without going to school, my mother was doing school in the morning sometimes. She was, sometimes she felt tired of doing this. And uh, on Sunday, she was uh, reading mass. Uh, my father was not participating in re reading those things. And um, the, uh, the impression we had, uh, my brother and I, to be in a, in a, in a world apart. And uh, we learned uh, really a lot of things uh, related to nature, to, to natural life. The two years spent in Nigeria had a profound effect on Leclesio. For a child who had grown up hidden in wartime France, the liberty and freedom that Africa had offered him gave him a different perspective and would shape his outlook on life. When the family returned to Nice, the adjustment to the city would prove difficult. Europe was not, very, uh, not a very easy place to grow up in. Uh, 
and especially at the time of war, when we, there was war against Algeria, then there was the development of a certain type of racism and a, a very vulgar way of looking at the other. I mean, at the uh, at the foreign world, looking with despise and with uh, some kind of hatred to the other people, especially if they were black or if they were different. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea was a violent sea at that time. The war between Israel and, and the Arab countries, the war, the bombing on Lebanon, all those moments of the Mediterranean Sea were violent moments and you could feel them, you could see them. France was involved in the war in Algeria from 1954 to 1962. Nice was a city at the front line. Refugees escaping the conflict came back through the town and the backdrop of the War of Independence in Algeria was significant for Leclésio. The, uh, the independence was beginning at that time and someone told me about the movements of the people for their freedom and it made me uh, very enthusiastic. I was hoping for the freedom of those people. So I wrote a, an adventure novel and uh, uh, about 15 years later, I rewrote that novel, which was Desert. The sky was limitless and the blue so harsh that it burnt their faces. Even further away, men were walking in the web of dunes in a strange world. Yet this was their real world. The sand, these stones, this sky, this sun, this silence, this pain, and not the cities of metal and cement where the sounds of fountains and of human voices could be heard. Here was the empty order of the desert, where everything was possible, where you could walk without a shadow along the edge of your own death. I, 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 I felt that immigration was one of the um, very uh, intense moments where uh, the human beings were uh, confronted to, to the, uh, this aggressivity of life uh, and to, uh, uh, to a world which was in some ways refusing them, which was uh, wanting a, a world which wanted their strengths, their, uh, their, um, their energy and their power, but didn't want their soul, didn't want their, their being. And uh, this is typical of our times. They are prisoners of Dupanier. Perhaps they do not really know this. Perhaps they think they can leave one day and go somewhere else. Return to their mountain villages and muddy valleys find those they have left, parents, children, friends. But this is impossible. The narrow streets with old dilapidated walls, the dark apartments, the damp, cold rooms where the grey air constricts the lungs, the stifling workshops where girls work in front of their machines making trousers and dresses. In a way, I feel like them because, as I said, going to Africa, coming back, feeling inadequate in, the, in Nice for such a long time, feeling awkward. And um, I thought it was because I was not on the good side. And in fact, when I was in my teens, I was nearly unable to speak. I was unable to express myself by speech. I had to write. At a certain point, I had to leave the town. And this, this was more or less at the moment of my military service when I was due to go to Algeria. 
I eventually did my military service. I was sent to Thailand. I spent one year in Bangkok uh, teaching uh, political sciences instead of doing my military service. And after that, I could not, for some reason, I could not come back really to Nice. After that, the, um, the, uh, the enchantment was broken for some reason. Enough of this I. The person I want to talk about is him, is myself, after becoming his friend. He is there. He has fled. He has moved forward against a background of crimes, hostile looks, wars. He's lived in all those places that people hurry through. In airport concourses, dance halls, hotels, ships, rafts, plastic and chrome bars. He's visited every derelict site. He's lugged bags and suitcases. He's burned up a lot of cigarette paper. He's drunk every kind of water, beer, rice, wine. Why has he done all that? What was the point? There wasn't any. No point at all. Writing about what you dislike it gives you some kind of pleasure, but at the same time it, uh, it, um, uh, it shuts you down in your, in your own mind and it um, makes you a prisoner of your obsessions. So I had to find a, a, an escape and uh, th that was the time. Laclesio in the late 60s was increasingly nomadic and restless. Escaping Nice, he travelled to Mexico and Central America, rootless save for an emotional attachment to Mauritius, the island home of Laclesio's parents and their ancestors. In 1969, he journeyed into the forests of Central America and over the next three years spent long periods with the Imbera, a native tribe of Panama, where he removed himself from Western civilization altogether. What I felt is, uh, when I was a child and I came back from Africa, I, was, I had something different, I had gathered something different in Africa. And this, thing, this different thing was difficult to express. I had to hide it in certain ways. And going back then in the, in the forest in Central America uh, was trying to reconnect with this uh, past, with this uh, past experience. But then um, it was not Oxid Western life against uh, which is natural life or something like that. It was something different. It was more like uh, my, my older self trying to connect with the modern dimension of my life. Uh, I was living like a modern man, living, uh, I mean, man from the cities. And uh, go going back to the forest was trying to reconnect my older self, which was being Mauritian, being uh, from Mauritius, being, having lived in Africa, trying to reconnect all these pieces of puzzle. Those people were living without writing, without books, and they could live very well. And they were probably better uh, together than we could be. They, um, they, were, they had a better share of culture than we could ever have, because the uh, Western, if we could say so, the Western culture is elitist. It addresses to just a happy few. While those people, when they were um, singing their myths or uh, living together were very um, equal. I remember one old man we, we, uh, we had buried with all his belongings and his belongings were just a uh, goblet and um, probably a, a calabash and a, a knife. That was all he had in life, he had nothing else. 
And uh, when we think uh, what we leave when, uh, when, we, when we die, and all the things which remain after us, this is terrible, too much. One, one day, I, as I had this physical feeling of being on the threshold of something. I was on the threshold, I was sitting on the other side. The world was totally different on the other side. It was the same world, but I was on the threshold and on the other side, the, the, the world had changed. So my, my effort was trying to cross the threshold. And to a certain point, I had to go back. I, I could not cross it totally. If I had crossed it, maybe I would not have carried on uh, writing books. I, I stood on the, on the other side, so I still have to, to write books. I, I felt I had really changed um, very deep inside. I think the change was even in the way I was writing, the, the, the way I was expressing myself. I had uh, changed a lot of things. It's difficult to say it's not words, not adjectives. Um, it's not even, I would say, the inspiration. It's more like a kind of detachment. Not detachment really, but a kind of um, of, uh, I would say, some sort of philosophy, uh, another way of looking at things. Like if all the known things were not definitive, that if something could be changed in the, in the world we live in, or if a part of this world was not necessary, and we were thinking that it's necessary, but we are mistaken. It's, it's that order. It, it sounds pretentious in some ways, but it's really what I was feeling, that uh, living in the forest and reconnecting with my, my older self gave me the opportunity to, to um, probably wipe out what was vain, what was useless what I used to believe in and was not any more necessary. I can remember everything I received when I arrived in Africa for the first time. A freedom so intense that it burnt, made me drunk, so pleasurable that it hurt. I'm not talking about the exotic. Children are total strangers to that vice. Not because they can see through people and things, but precisely because they can only see them. A tree, a hollow in the ground, a column of carpenter ants, a band of noisy kids in search of a game, an old man with milky eyes holding out his bony hand, a street in an African village on market days. It was all the streets in all the villages, all the old men, all the children, all the trees and all the ants. This treasure is still alive deep down inside me. It cannot be extracted. Far from being made of simple memories, it's made of certainties. If I hadn't had this knowledge of Africa in the flesh, if I hadn't received this inheritance of my life before my birth, what would have become of me? Au moment de vous parler de Jean Fanchette et de l'île Equinox, il me vient à l'esprit que, euh, il a, il, au fond, il n'y a jamais de hasard. Et pourquoi je suis aujourd'hui à, à rosille Beaubassin Eh bien, c'est vrai que cet endroit m'est assez cher à Maurice, parce que dans ma famille, on a vécu à rosille Beaubassin. Mon grand-père Léon, euh, qui était juge, à la fin de sa vie, il est venu habiter à rosille bourbassin il était citoyen de Rosil. Et euh, donc j'ai ce lien très particulier avec cette, euh, avec cette petite ville qui a beaucoup de charme. Et euh, ce n'est pas sans émotion que je suis ici et que j'évoque sa mémoire. Il 
being a writer, you belong to an elite. And what interests you most are the, peop the ordinary people. You want to, to write and to, uh, and to explore their lives because the, uh, the common lives are the most beautiful lives. And they escape in a certain way because you are not living that ordinary life. Something of the of the day-to-day -day life escapes to you when you write. You are not in the in the current. It's being artistic. I mean, the notion of art is something very difficult to accept in uh, in the uh, in the human uh, culture in the human society. So the the societies where art is not predominant are the when we speak about the natural societies, people living in strong contact with nature. They don't have to, uh, to request those uh, escapes, uh, artistic escapes. They, uh, they are themselves. So this is one of the paradoxes. Uh, I think we are full of those paradoxes. Still, it's true that I feel a great concern for uh, uh, the ordinary lives. It's, it's what attracts me more. The yeah, ordinary life of an ordinary person, uh, the, the, your neighbor going out, uh, going to the market, buying a few things, coming back home, having her own problems, maybe with her husband or, or her children, uh, full of angst, and then getting growing old and being anxious about her old age, who is going to take care of me and uh, uh, the last moments of her life. It's a life full of very extraordinary moments and very terrible moments and everything together makes a life and it's a precious thing and being a writer I can have only a smell of that precious beauty. Was it a shock to win the Nobel Prize for Literature? Yes, it was a huge, uh, uh, in some ways terrifying, in other ways very, uh, very pleasant surprise. Because uh, the first question is, what have I done? Do I deserve it? Some people seem to think I deserve it. I remember what uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges said uh, about his own writing. He said. I write very ordinary things. Some people find it excellent. They are mistaken, but I thank them for that. I thank them for that mistake. So I could say that to the Nobel, uh, Nobel Acad Academy. Uh, it's a mistake, but I thank you very much for that mistake. It's what I felt. Mm -hmm.